Hi, this is Celeste Barnett, the principal at Digeno Middle School. I had the pleasure of meeting with every single one of our students over the last two days through their history classes because I wanted them to hear directly from me what my hopes are for having a fun, joyful, relaxing, celebratory, calm last few weeks and months of school. And I felt I owed it to our students to be um, very specific about where the boundary is so that they hopefully will not step over that line and get themselves into a situation where they may not be permitted to participate in some of the fun end of the year activities. So when I was speaking with the students, one of the things that I started with was my first, second, and third most important job as principal of this school is to keep kids safe, even more than helping them learn. Of course, I care about their learning, but my number one job is to help keep them safe. I wanted them to understand that there are um, some limitations due to the number of uh, super supervisory staff that we have. We have almost 800 children at this school, and we love having those children at this school. To be specific, we have 781 kids who are enrolled in Degeno Middle School. There are some times during lunch and during snack when we may only have three folks helping to supervise out at lunch and snack. And so there's a picture in the bottom left-hand corner of Mr. Anthony, he's there with Mr. Carlos, but Mr. Anthony is our campus supervisor. He does an amazing job. Ms. Whidden is our assistant principal currently and myself. Now there are other times when we have way more people out there helping. We have teachers who come out and help. We have um, counseling staff who come out and help. We've got a lot, of, Mr. Carlos comes and helps. We've got a lot of people who pitch in when they can, but there are times when there are just three of us trying to keep um, 800 kids safe. And so I explained to the kids that while it may seem that sometimes we are overreacting when they are just messing around, like stomping a milk carton, which makes a very loud gunshot type noise, or when a, a friend takes their hat off their head and then they go chase them, or oh, what are some other examples of things that they tend to do? Oh, play fighting. So they're, they're messing around with each other. And from across the quad, it's hard for us to tell whether they are seriously fighting or if someone is just messing around. So I, help, I tried to help them understand that if I don't have the time to come and have a, an extended conversation with them to say, okay, I just saw so-and-so you know, hitting you or shoving you. Are you okay? Were y'all just joking around? Or are you, you know, were you in danger? Do you need my help? I wish I had more time to have those long conversations, but again, I'm trying to supervise the entire quad, um, and sometimes I may just have to say, guys, I need you to knock it off, or please stop running, or um, keep your hands to yourself, and that we're not trying to be unkind. It's just sort of where we are right now, and that it would really help if they could help us do our jobs by not having us be distracted by you know, messing around with kind of lower level horseplay stuff. So I just was trying to give them some context about, you know, what, what we're um, working with so that they don't think we're just, you know, breathing down their necks and not understanding that they're middle schoolers and some most of the time just messing around. Okay, so on this next slide, I specifically put a picture of the e-bikes up here. Um, you may or may not know that on a typical day, 150 to sometimes 200 children ride their e-bikes to school. And I wanted to compliment the students because I have seen such an improvement from the start of the year as far as kids wearing their helmets, buckling their helmets, because they don't do any good if they're not buckled, and walking their bikes on the pavement, on the sidewalk, so they're not running over pedestrians. So those are my three major things that I can sort of remind kids of on campus and I just wanted to compliment them on how much better that has gotten. Now that said, I am still very concerned about what I hear and sometimes what I see as far as children riding their bikes in an unsafe manner when they're out on the streets, around cars, scares me to death. I am floored that no one has been seriously hurt. Um, but I've seen improvements, so I wanted to compliment them on that. 
I also talked to them about the concept, which is what this slide is about, of in loco parentis. And I said, again, I am sharing this information today with you, not as a threat, not trying to be negative, but I want you to know, I want you to be educated. I want you to be informed as to sort of where the jurisdiction of the school begins and ends so you can make good decisions and hopefully not get in trouble. So of course, we are responsible for your child's safety when they are on campus. But in loco parentis also means that I am, and I told them that these are the words I use, that I am your parent. I am your parent when you are at school and also on your way to school and on your way home from school. I am legally responsible for our children's safety from the time they leave you, the parent. I am the parent in between the parent and the parent. So when they leave school and when they get home from school, excuse me, when they leave home and when they get home from school. Now there's limitations to that, but I wanted them to get the idea that if children are, say, engaging in a slap boxing fight, which thankfully has become far and far less, it's almost gone away here on campus, um, but ne because they know that the rules apply here, but now what we've heard is that they're going to local parks right after school and take doing engaging in slap boxing and videotaping it and uploading it to social media. And I wanted them to know that more often than not, in the course of a fight like that, someone sends me the video. And so I usually see who was fighting, who was videotaping, who was cheering when someone was getting smacked in the head. I wanted them to be aware that I do see a lot of that and that if I know about that, that, that I wanna keep them safe. And so I will be talking to the parent and I could technically suspend them for fighting even though they're not on campus. I also let them know that, for example, on their way to school, if they are vaping while they're riding their bike or they're at the 7-Eleven and they shoplift and put something in their pocket that they didn't purchase and the manager shares video with me and says, is this one of your students, Dr. Barnett? that I technically can take school action. So again, this isn't about threatening. It was about just know that I care about you and I care about your safety and that you know school rules apply in a lot of different places. I also talked to them that bottom bullet down there about social media and I said, believe me, I do not want to see your TikToks or your Snapchats or read your group texts. I don't wanna see it. But sometimes a parent will send those items to me because their child is being bullied online. And they'll email me and they'll say, Dr. Barnett, read this group chat. There are some pretty awful things being said to my child. They're feeling bullied. They don't feel safe coming to your school. How can you help me? In situations like that, it does become school business because it is impacting a student at school. They aren't feeling safe at school. They cannot learn because of what's gone on online. And so I just wanted to sort of raise their awareness there. Regarding suspendable acts, again, this is just reminders. So they hopefully will not do these things. I said, these things that are listed on this screen, I am legally required to suspend for. So even if I adore that kid and there's um, a mitigating you know, circumstances, sometimes I do not have the authority to avoid a suspension. I purposefully put this picture of this tiny little knife up here. It's a one inch blade, it's a pocket knife. I said it probably couldn't even cut paper, but I literally had to suspend a student for that, for being in possession of that specific um, tool, knife, on campus. So I talked to them about the fact that there are actually times when a student might accidentally bring um, a knife to school and that there's a way to not be in trouble for that. I gave the example of if a family goes hunting or camping or fishing over the weekend and they're with their family and they're allowed to use a knife because they're using it as a tool, not as a weapon and they're using their backpack, their school backpack, and they put the knife back in their backpack, and they come to school on Monday morning and they open up their backpack and they say, oh, oh, I'm not supposed to have this. What can I do about that? I also gave the example of if they shoot airsoft guns and whatnot, and they have your permission to do it. I don't care, it's not my business. Um, but again, maybe they put that fake plastic 
you know, airsoft gun into their backpack and then they accidentally bring it to school. So I asked them, how can you not be in trouble? How can you avoid being in trouble if you realize that you accidentally bought, brought a weapon to school? And they very quickly raised their hand and said, take it to the office. And I said, absolutely, please do not show it to your friends. Do not take it out and wave it around. Bring it straight to the office. Let us know what happened. We are very reasonable people and you will not be in trouble. We will need to call your parent because obviously I cannot give a weapon back to a child. I will have to give it to the parent, but no one's in trouble as long as they're communicating with us and it's that type of situation. All right, so then I went through these bullets just real quickly. I reminded them that fighting is a suspendable offense, including slap boxing. So many of our kids think slap boxing isn't a big deal. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it's a form of sparring and they are literally slapping each other in the head. It is fighting. Um, so whether they agree with me or not that it's a big deal, it is fighting and it is suspendable. I explained to them also that they do not have to lay a hand on somebody to be in trouble for threatening to do bodily harm. So I gave the example of if you write in a text message or you say to someone, you better watch your back or so-and-so is going to jump you after school. I said, those are threats to do bodily harm and you can and most likely will be suspended for that. Weapons we'd already talked about, obviously bullying or harassment vandalism thankfully we don't have much vandalism anymore now that phones aren't going into the bathroom and they're not recording for TikTok challenges vandalism has gone way down unfortunately the next one theft we are just really experiencing a lot of kids stealing other kids Chromebook styluses and it's not just at Degenio. it is across the district it is across the state it is across the country it is a problem they're so small they're so easy to pocket that unfortunately kids are stealing them and then they're trying to resell them or they're just replacing theirs that got stolen or whatever misplaced so i said i am so sorry i wish i could tell you that i could prevent your stylus from being stolen i do not have that power I can promise that if I know who stole your stylus, and I can prove that, that they will be suspended for theft and perhaps for selling, because that's not legal either. But the best advice I can give your kids is to not keep their stylus in their Chromebook. There's a little slot in the Chromebook where they are usually stored and that unfortunately is where kids are stealing them from. When a kid turns their back, they just slip it out or when the kids go out for a break a mid-class break you know somebody might hang back a tiny bit and pick up some styluses so I said the best thing you can do is keep your stylus in your backpack or in your pocket and I just apologize that I have to tell you how to prevent being a victim of a crime at school but that's kind of where we are right now I'm going to talk about hateful language in just a minute on another slide Lunch reminders, I complimented the kids. I said, most of the time, most of our kids are very, very good about picking up their trash. And the birds are not happy about it because the trash is getting picked up. Although these are actual pictures from campus. Um, I also complimented them and said that I appreciate it when I walk over to a table and, uh, you know, the group um, may have abandoned one kid. One kid may be left with everybody's lunch still on the table and kids are usually very responsible and respectful when I come over and say either let's pick this up together or do you mind you know cleaning up for your friends I'm sorry you got left with it and they're usually pretty good about that I told them that that last picture in the bottom right hand corner which is some orange peels and maybe some carrots um, that picture was sent to be my coach McCullough who is our um, basketball PE coach. And he asked if I would just remind the students that food is not permitted on the blacktop. So we have the blacktop and the basketball courts open every day at lunch. And we want kids to go out there and run and burn off energy. That's fantastic. We love it. But I just wanted to make sure they remembered that we can't have food out there. I also, that fourth bullet down there, talked about blue lines. I don't know if you've ever noticed, but around campus, we have... Um, blue lines painted on the pavement in certain areas and they indicate inbounds and out-of-bounds areas 
And I said, the reason we have those is not to be overly restrictive with where you can go. Again, it comes back down to supervision. We need students, aside from being on the blacktop where we have a supervisor and in the learning commons where we have a supervisor, everybody else, we need pretty much to be within eyesight of the main quad. So there's a back quad back by the P building that is off limits during lunch. And I so understand that the main quad can sometimes be a little chaotic and a little loud and students might want to find a quiet area in the back to kind of chill out. But unfortunately, if I can't see them, I can't make sure that they're safe. And they seem to understand that. I typically stand at the bathroom, so that's kind of my fun post. Um, because look, I hate when I hear, it hurts my heart when I hear from parents that their kid does not feel safe going into the bathroom and that they hold it all day. I don't want that. And so I know that at least during snack and lunch, when I am standing immediately outside of the bathroom, most likely kids are not vaping in there and they're not fighting in there. I think when I am standing there, I can almost guarantee that it's a safe environment and hope that that is comforting to kids who might be worried about it. So when I'm standing at the bathroom, I'm sort of tethered to that space. I walk around a little bit, but I don't go too far. And I at least need to have a visual on the rest of the quad so that I can radio to somebody else who's helping me supervise and say, do you mind going over by the flagpole? I see flagpole. I see something maybe brewing over there. Can you go check it out? So anyway, I think they understood about the blue lines. Um, I just don't want them to think our rules are just completely random or punitive. There are reasons for them. Dress code reminders. I told them that this is probably my least favorite thing to talk about, but it is going to become more and more of an issue as the weather warms up. So for example, today it was raining and cold, and so we didn't have any dress code issues because everybody had on their sweatshirts and they were all bundled up and there wasn't a lot of skin showing. So what I told them, I'm talking about the bottom part of this slide right here, is that, okay, so kids can wear shorts to school. I don't care. No problem. They can be as tight as they want. They can be as short as they want, but they have to cover their butt cheeks. So their bottoms have to be covered. Okay, so that's it when it comes to shorts. There's no, you know, fingertip length, all that kind of stuff. We don't do that anymore. The majority of their chest needs to be covered by the clothing, by their clothing. And then technically the dress code says all of your abdomen has to be covered. I put in parentheses almost. We're a little bit flexible and slack about that because it's the style right now. Crop tops are in and they look cute. But what I tell the kids is I really need the bottom of the shirt and the top of the pants to come close to meeting in the middle, right? If they lift up their arms and there's a sliver of stomach showing, okay, no big deal. The other thing that I told them is I don't, they're, especially the eighth graders, they are almost adults. They like hearing that, maybe not quite almost adults, but I would rather work with them in that moment right there while we're standing outside to say, can we fix this right now so we don't need to send you to the office because Miss Mallory has better things to do or to put it in your record in Aries or to call your parent. How about if we just deal with this right now? And so how about if you tie a sweatshirt around your waist or zip up your sweatshirt or um, untie the knot in the back of the shirt. They tie their knots in the back of the shirt and it looks super cute, but it makes their a lot of their midriff show. Just untie that knot um, or roll down, excuse me, roll up your pants. They roll their pants down and down and down and down and down. And so there's, you know, a lot showing. So if we can fix it in the moment, no problem. If they are repeatedly wearing things that we have to talk about or their shirt is so short, it's like at the bottom of, um, of their, you know, their bra level, um, and there's no way that the, that the bottom of the shirt is going to meet the pants no matter what we do, then I do need to send them to Miss Mallory, and she's going to give them a loner PE shirt, which is not as cute as what they wore to school, and let's just not have that be an issue. So that's that. I did tell them, too, about the top half of this, um, of this slide that, strangely enough, funnily enough, the dress code does not just apply to your dress. It also applies to your personal items and your belongings. So if you have stickers on your e-bike helmet, you have stickers on your binder or on your water bottle, or you draw something on your binder, it cannot 
glamorize or advertise or promote basically anything that's illegal for children to partake in. So if there is a marijuana leaf on a bike helmet, that's a violation of the dress code. If there is um, a Budweiser bottle on their um, shirt, they can't wear that. If they have a Playboy bunny or they have a shirt that has a slogan that is misogynistic or something, you know, that that could be a problem. Um, and then I'm happy to talk to them about individual items and we can figure out whether it violates dress code or not. But that's kind of the dress code thing. All right, technology. At this point in the presentation, I pull my iPhone out from my back pocket and I say, I get that it might feel unfair to you that I am allowed to have my phone in my back pocket and you are not allowed to. However, I'm an adult and that's the way it is. If your phone, kids, is in the, your front or your back pocket or your AirPods are in your ears, they think they can pull their hair down over their ears or their hoodie up and we don't see the AirPods, we see them, we know, then they are likely to get confiscated. And that is just our away for the day cell phone policy and it is proven to make our campus much safer and to make our kids more social with one another and believe it or not it makes grades go up so parents are usually on board with it kids hate it but what i said is we do not want to harass you about your phone leave it in your backpack and there's no problem this picture on here some of them thought it was such a beautiful picture that i must have gotten it off the internet i said nope those are phones that were all taken from students who had them in their pockets on one day before snack. So within the first two hours of school, we have better things to do. We do not want to be the phone police. Please, please, please keep them in your backpacks. All right. All right, this slide. That first bullet there is about really hate speech. I said, we will not tolerate hate speech on campus. You cannot, and under any circumstances, use the N-word. It's never okay at school. You cannot use the F slur to talk about people who are gay. You cannot write a swastika on something. All of that is hate speech. And I said, it does not matter if you were just joking. It does not matter if you are not racist and didn't mean any harm. It does not matter if the person you said it to doesn't care and isn't offended. It is hate speech. It is hate speech. It is hate speech. And we will not tolerate that. As far as bullying goes, that second bullet there, of course we don't tolerate bullying, but I know kids are nervous about giving you or giving me someone's name who is bullying them. And I understand that fear. However, nothing breaks my heart more than getting an email, especially at this time of the year from a parent saying, my kid has been bullied since the beginning of school. And I say, why didn't you let us know? And they said, because my, my child is afraid of retribution or they won't even tell me the name like they'll say to the parent the parent will say my child will not tell me who it is but can you do something and I'm like I'm not sure what I can do aside from following your child around all day which I can't unless you can help me figure out who it is and so what I told them and what I often tell parents is I'm not going to lie to you and say that I can 100% stop bullying from happening I don't have that power but I can take action and I do know a lot about bullying, and I know how to decrease it significantly, but I have to know who we're talking to. And once I have talked to a child about their bullying behavior towards somebody else, if they do it again, I can take a lot more serious action. If they come after your kid and say, why did you tell Dr. Barnett? You know, I'm going to kick your butt, whatever. That's called intimidating a witness, and I can take action about that. So I cannot promise bullying will stop but I can make it better, but I need to know who it is, who's doing it. Okay, and then language, it, we're just getting a lot of F-bombs and the S-word and stuff like that said around campus, which is typical in the spring that that happens more, but I just reminded them that's not appropriate for school. All right, so loss of privileges list. I'm gonna bring up a document here, and somehow you typed a period in there. Okay, so this pertains mostly to eighth graders, but it does have an impact on seventh graders as well. So at the end of the year, there are so many fun activities for both seventh and eighth graders. We want to end the year in a celebratory way with everybody being happy and having fun. 
However, at this time of the year, especially after spring break, kids kind of start to lose their minds a little bit and they seem to lose the ability to control their behavior. Well, that's not true. They don't lose the ability. They kind of use lose the, the willingness to try to control their behavior, but they become much more slack about getting to school late, especially on rainy days. They know that that's, they think that's an excuse and that we're going to give them 10 minutes leeway. We're not going to keep doing that. They need to get to school in the morning because most of the time it's not your fault as the parent. It's your kid. <laughs> and they tell us that. They're like, yeah, I just was spending some extra time on my makeup or I was waiting for my friend or I went by 7-Eleven or whatever it might be. So let's go back. So at the end of the year, especially for eighth graders, there are three at least really fun things. In addition to that, there's a dance on May, March 23rd, March 23rd. And then at the end of the year, there's a yearbook signing party. There's a Knott's Berry Farm trip. The way I tell, describe it to the kids is we all get to skip school on the same day and go to Knott's Berry Farm. It is super fun. I want you to be able to do that when you're an eighth grader. The promotion or graduation ceremony. I said the last thing in the world I want to do is to call your parent and say, call grandma and grandpa, tell them not to come because their child is not going to be participating in the promotion ceremony because they got suspended and got on the loss of privileges list. I don't want that to happen. That's why we're having this talk so that you don't get yourself in that trouble. So we talked about the fact that after spring break, things reset and the way you get your way onto the loss of privileges or LOP list is if you earn at least three detentions, you will be on the LOP list. If you are suspended, if you earn a Friday night school for something that you've done, you will be on the loss of privileges list. Now, tardies, lunch detention, excuse me, can be earned for tardies. And again, during the school day, we almost never have kids late getting to class. It is all before school and it has gotten bad lately and we need your help. These kids need to get to class on time. They have to be all the way in their classroom, not just on campus, not just in the gates, all the way in their classroom before the 815 bell rings. So three tardies, makes a detention. So you can see if you do the math, you'd actually have to be late nine times to get on the LOP list for tardies, although we've got some kids who are late every single day and it's not going to take them any time at all to get there. Other ways you, they can earn lunch detentions is by, you know, I don't know, lots of things they can do out on the quad where they are repeatedly causing, you know, havoc. Or a teacher writes a classroom referral um, and so there's several different ways you can earn detentions, but any three detentions is going to result in being on the LOP list. But the way I want them to think about the LOP list is not my life is ruined. I've lost all the fun things. It's more like a warning, warning, warning. I cannot make another mistake after I'm on the loss of privileges list. So there are certainly things a student can do that they are going to be on that loss of privileges list and there's no way to earn their way off if it is completely, you know, egregious, bringing, a, you know, a gun to school. You know, you're not going to Knott's Berry Farm, right? That doesn't happen. We have not had a gun at campus, but I'm just trying to give you an example. But if it's one of these sort of lower level isolated events, then the way you earn your way off the list is by not getting in trouble again, right? And you can see that numbers one through four is basically don't get in trouble again. Number five is you also need to take responsibility for whatever you did that got you put on that list. And so that's going to be an essay that they will write to me where they say, this is what I did. This is why it was wrong. That is not who I am as a person. You know I have better character than that. I won't do it again. And would you please let me go on the trip? So there are ways to get off the list. We want to be forgiving. We understand that, um, you know, kids are kids. Um, but that's what the loss of privileges list is about. And then the last slide, what I say to the kids is, I know that all of this kind of negative talk that we just had to have to, to discuss does not apply to most of you. Most of you would never in a million years um, do any of these things that would ever get you on the loss of privileges list. And you are the reason why I am coming around and talking to everyone because you deserve to have a fun, safe, enjoyable, happy, 
end of the school year and I don't want a couple of knuckleheads to spoil it for everybody. And I want the kids who might tend to sometimes be knuckleheads to know I believe in you. You can do this. We can get you to the finish line and you can enjoy all the fun things and go and have a wonderful life in high school and beyond. So that is the message I shared with your children. I am happy to answer any questions you might have. Um, and I appreciate your partnership in helping this be a safe and kind, uh, caring community for everybody. Thank you.